Looney Tunes cartoons have returned to HBO Max, and they brought with them Ralph Phillips. I've been waiting all year for this. So, of course, you realize this means podcast. Are you ready, eager young space cadet? Where's the kaboom? There was supposed to be an earth-shattering kaboom. Hello and welcome to Of Course You Realize This Means Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Graves. And with me today, it is my pleasure to bring on the Toonie Tenor. He is a contributor to Anthony's Animation Talk and a lifelong fan of Looney Tunes, as well as a music a musician in his own right. And I believe you sing as well. Like you're an operatic singer, correct? Yes, I am. I mean, uh, I started singing when I was a little kid, when I was three. Um, just one day, started randomly singing opera. Not July, well, not opera, but just like with that particular sound with the vibrato. Um, but I don't come from a music family, minus my grandma, who uh, she passed away a few years ago, but I think of her every day. She was uh, she liked opera. She took some lessons here and there after she uh, uh, immigrated from Cuba, but never got to do anything uh, on a major level. And then I inherited the gift, so to speak. And then I started singing in public uh, when I was six in elementary school, and I started singing the uh, Figaro's aria from the Barbara Seville, the, you know, uh, uh, Largo al Facto to Mar, you know, Figaro, 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 all that fun stuff. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> my teacher, Mr. Walker, another uh, huge reason why I do music, uh, he, he passed away as well. So my grandma and my first music teacher are the two people that result in what I am now. And he thought, you know, I was just goofing around in kindergarten class because my elementary school was not the best one, not in the best area. And he's like, who's making fun of opera? And I'm like, it was, <laughs> I'm like, I'm not making fun of it. I'm just singing la di da. And then a few months later, when, <laughs> when I went to first grade, he put me on stage in front of the whole school. I sang by myself, you know, my country tizzity. And from there, sure. I'm like, this is really awesome. I want to keep going with it. And, you know. Sang in choir, sang in band, uh, sang, you don't sing in band. I played in band in school. You know, I, I got two degrees in music. Uh, my undergrad is in music education. And I, I have some experience teaching as well, public school music. And my master's is in performance. And funny, a few years ago, right around the time I was doing my master's, um, and just revisiting some cartoons, because Going to grad school helped further, like, really solidify my love of these cartoons because I took a film music class. Even though I'm not a huge uh, film buff, I, I barely watched any movies and I never rented them growing up. But I wanted to, like, use that knowledge of, like, film music and scores and soundtracks and how the whole process works to help me appreciate more the stuff that Carl Stalling and Milt Franklin did in these cartoons. And yeah. I was rewatching Notes to You, the 41 uh, Porky Pig cartoon from Frizz Freeling. And I was rewatching. I was like, man, I used to watch this all the time on those really cheap public domain VHSs. I'm showing my age. And uh, <laughs> and I got to the part, you know, where the cats start singing uh, Figaro's Aria. And then that's when the light bulb hit me. I'm like, this is where I picked up on that song. There's no other way because some of my earliest memories – are of watching specific Warner Brothers cartoons like uh, Notes to You, Wakiki Wabbit, um, The Wacky Wabbit, Gold Rush Days. Like those are ingrained in my brain because I saw them on those VHSs, you know, back in the day. And I'm like, that's why I started because I was copying exactly how Mel Blanc did the cat's voice in that cartoon in class. And then, yeah. you know, it's like, it all, it's like, you know, I, I tell people, you know, the, uh, Spider-Man got bitten by, you know, uh, the, the radioactive spider. Batman's parents were killed. The turtles were mutated by the ooze from the Utroms. Me, I saw Porky Pig and a cat sing. And, you know, <laughs> one thing led to another. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. A lot of people come on here and they say Looney Tunes were their, was their gateway into learning English. Mm. And you have this gateway into learning music literacy, music history. And, you know appreciating the the classic the operatic voices and and notes of a past bygone era but they have influenced your life in such a grand way 
like I think Looney Tunes has that effect on people where, you know, for me, it's a comedy. Like I, I really latch on to the comedy aspects of Looney Tunes and growing up, like that was my indicator of what was funny, you know? And so having these shorts be that influential in our life, I think is something to treasure. And I think that's why we're all still talking about them. We're all celebrating them and we're connected to them in that way because they, they gave to us, you know, they, they, they did a good job of capturing a moment in time and, you know, elevating the technology that was available at the time and, and, and entertaining audiences, but they have done so much for the culture that has, you know, really took from that animation artistry, those, those writers, those artists, the, the, the layouts, everything about the, the craftsmanship that went into those old school Looney Tunes is still being fed back into today. That goes in hand in hand with the appreciation that Looney Tunes cartoons gives to the the predecessor. Like the, the last time we saw shorts like this was the 50s, was the 60s. And, you know, it, it's been so long since we've had that. It is really refreshing to go back to that, which is why I have endeared so much of my life looking for something like this. And this new batch of cartoons just shows you why that works for these characters. They, they don't necessarily need a movie. They don't need an ongoing 30 minute, you know, episode series. It, it, they need these shorts. They need compact time and as many jokes as possible to fit that in, but also classical music. Classical music is a big part in why Looney Tunes works and why they were so instrumental in our, you know, our growing years, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's something that in my experiences as a, a classical musician, as well as, you know, having experience teaching, you know, uh, public school music, I, you know, from kindergarten all the way up to eighth grade, you know, I taught choir music. But one thing that I keep telling not just kids, but also adults that are, are I'm assuming we're around the same age. Uh, <laughs> and, yeah. but, you know, also people that are older than us that, you know, they were like, for, I always geek out when I ask my dad, he doesn't remember. I'm like, but my father was a very little kid when these cartoons first came to television in the mid fifties. And I'm like, do you remember this and that? But, and I keep seeing the meme uh, and I actually posted it on my Instagram again, that whole meme. So like, how did you learn about classical music? And it's a clip of, uh, you know, Bugs and Elmer from rabbit of Seville. And that's something that I just cherish. I mean, with other studios as well, Disney did in Walter Lance and, and Fleischer and all that, but in particular, Warner brothers just had such a great grasp on classical music itself and i always tell people and and i'm guilty i try not to be guilty of the, the stereotype of you know how classical musicians are a bunch of snobs and they're socially awkward i mean i'm socially awkward in different ways but you know <laughs> but you know just <laughs> and that inaccessibility of classical music but like when i talk to people it's like you know i'll tell them like oh i learned uh, the music of Richard wagner and peter tchaikovsky and and you know wolfgang amadeus mozart and chopin and all these other composers by watching warner brothers shorts and in particular i could always pinpoint like i said chopin i'm thinking of the scene in i got plenty of mutton when the wolf is trying to eat barely whatever he has there or you know uh uh, Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto in B flat minor, the beginning of a corny concerto, you know, the love that short and a funny story. When I was an undergrad, I, um, like I said, I did my undergrad at Montclair state university here in New Jersey. Um, and I was taking, um, a music, uh, vo uh what was it a repertoire class? So I was learning about art songs, which is music set to poetry, German, French, Italian, okay. uh, you know, 1800s, 1900s, around that time period. And we were talking about the music of Franz Schubert, which most people know as the guy who wrote the Ave Maria that you hear at weddings a lot. Um, sure. And my teacher was also talking. Also in the Batman. Hey, are you there? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I actually geeked out when I saw the Batman. I was like, oh, Schubert. And then someone's looking at me like, what are you talking about? I'm like, the song. Oh, okay. And uh, great film, by the way. And um I was, you know, he, we were talking about Schubert and my teacher was like, all right, we're going to be talking about Der Erlkönig, uh, the Earl King, which is like a scary, mysterious, evil spirit. 
um, it was based off the poetry of uh, Goethe. So my teacher starts playing the track in class. He's like, all right, let's listen to it and we'll discuss it. And the first thing I hear on the piano, and I, my eyes lit up like a Christmas tree. And my teacher, uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Osting, he's a, he's a classical uh, opera singer as well. I look at him, he's like, Manny, what's going on? And I go, I'm Yosemite Sam, the roughest man. And I start imitating <laughs> Sam in the middle of class. And he starts cracking up. I'm like, you learned it from watching Looney Tunes, did it? I'm like, that's Yosemite Sam's music. I didn't know that was Schubert. Yosemite Sam. It's Yosemite Sam. Yosemite Sam. Yeah, Yosemite Sam. The roughest, toughest, he-man, stuffest hombre has ever crossed a Rio Grande. And I ain't no man be Pamby. Holy cow. It's just like my mind was blown. And it's it's so cool now that you know, with my experiences as, as a musician, with my degrees, you know, I'm 35 now. I just turned 35 not that long ago. And reminiscing on the days of watching these cartoons on, um, you know, like I most of what I saw was on Nickelodeon um, mainly. And I also saw like the AAP stuff on uh, TBS, TNT, whatever. Bugs Bunny show, yeah. I saw it here and there, occasionally in Channel 7 here in New York. But like applying that knowledge of the shorts and also I've been studying the history for the past 20 years or so and combining with my musical knowledge and I go back and I start picking up because I I've been watching the shorts in chronological order and I'm picking up on all the little musical things I never noticed before the classical music but not only that like I'm learning so much about the popular music that Carl Stalling implemented in these cartoons that are lost to time. And, you know, the the cliche ones, like you must've been a beautiful baby and I'm for, I'm forever blowing bubbles. But like speaking of a short, I saw as a kid in a case of the missing hair, um, you know, the scene when uh, Alabama and bugs are talking with each other before he hits him in the face with a pie. And I'm like, there was a song that I love the melody of da, 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 and then I looked it up and it's called Under a Strawberry Moon. Oh, you know, pop song from the 40s. And I'm like, I'm watching these shorts now and I'm like, I get them. I'm just sitting there. I mean, everybody laughs at the, at the puns and, and the slapstick and whatever, but I hear the, the little, I hear the melody playing in the score and I start cracking up and they're like, what are you laughing at? Like the song fits the scene. Then I got to explain the joke, but that's something that kind of bums me out that people don't know so much, but that is why I, you know, fortunately now I've been recording with Anthony Kodorak for his channel for Anthony's Animation Talk because I can help try to fill in those gaps of the musical knowledge that have been lost the time. And what you were saying before with like how these cartoons, uh, the current Looney Tunes cartoons are like a nice throwback to the, that era because, yeah, I'll be honest. I, you know, like I said, I was eight years old when Space Jam came out in 96 and it was Looney Tunes stuff. I went crazy. I was excited. Yeah. But same here. And, you know, and I had all the toys from McDonald's and whatnot. And I got the VHS for my ninth <laughs> birthday and all that. But and and just also that era of like how big Looney Tunes were in the 90s. But it was in a different way than it is done now with the Looney Tunes cartoons, because I mean, it's weird because Looney Tunes are so steeped in pop culture, but it's it's always strange. Like when I watch, you know, the the shorts from back then, it's like I I I know a lot of the pop culture references through re- you know through researching it, but I wasn't alive in the forties. I wasn't alive in the fifties. I mean, my my dad barely was in the fifties, and I had to sure. learn about it. But it's just like there's something about that timelessness of those shorts that that don't always work in some of the more modern interpretations of the shorts. But in these shorts, it's like a nice, healthy balance of acknowledging the times, like seeing characters using widescreen TVs and and cell phones and whatever, but still having remnants of the era of which they were made in. Like, you know, one of the shorts, Porky was driving like a Model T, just like, you know, the Porky and, and <laughs> Sylvester shorts from Jones in the 50s. And I'm like, I don't see many cars looking like that now. So... <laughs> Yeah, it's a good little throwback series that we, you know, honor and we we see that they are taking notes and influence from the classics, but they're putting their own spin on it, mm-hmm. which we appreciate. 
And yeah, it, it again, it's refreshing to see this. And you're talking about music matching a scene or a short. Well, I was going to save this for the end, but it, it <laughs> feels so relevant that we should just talk about it now. So one of the, the shining examples of this and a, a masterpiece of a cartoon, a modern cartoon at that, is Skyscraper Scrap. Now, I asked you to pick your top three from this latest batch of cartoons. And I also did the same. Skyscrap Skyscraper Scrap was at the top of both of our lists. <laughs> this is a wonderful cartoon featuring Sylvester and Tweety. One that I had been hinted at that was coming. And I had no idea it was coming in this batch. But my God, was I floored when I saw it and when I heard it. So this is a music and sound effects only track of a short and there's no dialogue and you can appreciate it for its nuance, for it the way that actions hit the beat and jokes hit the beat. There are Bob Clampett references here. You have one of those classic smiles from Tweety from A Tale of Two Kitties in here, which I thought I'd never see again because that that bird was naked <laughs> and this bird is yellow. <laughs> but the, the whole thing is just brilliant, directed by David Gimmel with storyboards by Mike Rucco and written by Mike Rucco, David Gimmel, Johnny Ryan, and Jacob Fleischer, set to, and you're going to talk about this more, uh, but The Thieving Magpie, which is known for being in Looney Tune cartoon shorts. And this is the first time it's been used in this new series. And I thought it was just delightful from the animation and uh, Todd Schaefer over at Tonic DNA was the animation supervisor. If you haven't listened to that interview I did with him, I highly recommend it. They are very in tune with Looney Tunes. Um, no pun intended or pun intended. <laughs> but I, I absolutely love the the fact that Tonic DNA continues to knock it out of the park. They have done some of my favorite shorts from this series and they continue to impress. They continue to shine and just the angles and the way that the characters move in this is just so fluid. So Manny, you watched Skyscraper Scrap. What was your overall takeaway and what was something that really stood out to you? Like, wow, I never thought I would see that. Well, you nailed pretty much most of what I was going to say, but I um, I was watching these uh, the, the current batch in order because I'm like that. You know, I have to watch chronologically. After I watch this one, I'm like, oh, this is going to be tough to beat because I mean, yeah, I'm I'm I, I most if, if you ask me right now, what are like my top 10 Looney Tunes shorts? A lot of them are music based. What's Hopper Doc, Rhapsody and Rivets, uh, Pizzicato Pussycat. You know, clearly, um, I mean, I have other ones that are non-music based baseball bugs, case of the stuttering pig, whatever. But I mean, just hearing. Well, first off, let me talk about like what you said with uh, it's funny when I was watching the Looney Tune cartoons, I never like this was the first time that I said, who is drawing this? Because this looks absolutely incredible. And like, I mean, yeah, I know with, you know, with uh, television animation, they outsource it to different studios. And like when you watch different shows, like, oh, yeah, that episode looks great. That one, not so much or whatever. But just the fluidity. And I think there was one particular shot. It might have been when I think they were falling down. I think um, I'm trying to remember because it's been a few days. But, you know, with Sylvester and Tweety both falling to the ground at the same time. But there was like some fluid shot. I'm like, oh, my God, this is absolutely gorgeous and then when i was done i was like i'm uh, fast forwarding through the end credits and i'm like tonic dna and i started looking them up and then after that all the other shorts i started pausing and writing down who animated the other one and i mean commendable work to all these studios but my goodness tonic i don't know what's going on over there they must there must be something in their tonic they're drinking no but it's just (laughs) absolutely gorgeous and, and like you said, the little touches of seeing, you know, the Orson era Tweety smile and yeah. and it's just like I know when people talk about the appeal of Looney Tunes cartoon or just Warner Brothers cartoons in general. And also we can include like stuff with Tom and Jerry, but like how Tom and Jerry holds up so well or characters like Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner because of the lack of dialogue. And we love these cartoons so much because of the dialogue, especially the work of, you know, Mel Blanc and you know, June Foray and Stan Freeberg and whatnot, but just like 
I think this one works kind of like with Tom and Jerry and 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 all with the Wiley e. Coyote shorts on another level because they are so accessible to everybody. And I know it's a cliche thing to say, but music is a universal language. But I mean, and and and, and as I was watching it, I started hearing it. I'm like, this is the thieving magpie. This is Rossini. I'm like, no, they're not going to say any dialogue. And just by the end of it, I'm just I was smiling like Tweety. I was just so delighted. And not only how beautiful it looked, but just how how funny it was, and just it it just it worked so well. It was just a, like you said, a great throwback to the musical era shorts, especially the ones of you could say Jones and Freeling in particular. And speaking of the little insight to uh, to the thieving magpie itself, so it was originally it's from an opera called La Gazza Ladra, which literally means the thieving magpie. From Gioacchino Rossini, Gioacchino, sorry, Gioacchi, my Italian is a little rusty. Rossini, one of the most famous opera composers in the world. Uh, this premiered in 1817, and it's not as well known as other operas, like clearly The Barber of Seville is his most famous, and William Tell. So, boom, two songs that you've never heard wow. of Warner Brothers cartoons. Never, no, <laughs> not at all. But, uh, but yeah, the... Um, yeah, you could again. You could thank all the times you're at Figaro's aria. You could thank the William Tell overture itself, the different parts of it, because people forget that the overture itself is 12 minutes long, and then you hear the da, 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 and then it goes to da, 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 and at the very end, the most famous part, you know, high old silver and whatnot. And also, I remember the thieving magpie in particular from. Uh, well, I think of a Clockwork Orange, obviously not the most family friendly film in the world, but I think of it from that film. But a Warner Brothers property. Oh, Warner so Brothers property, they, WB one hundred. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got my. I I actually got the the WB one hundred hat. Uh, just like uh, came in today. But also speaking Amazing. of cartoons heavily influenced by uh, Warner Brothers, every time I hear the theme Magpie, I think of Ren and Stimpy because it was used a lot in Ren and Stimpy. Okay. And 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 kind of like you know the circle of life or whatever, how Ren and Stimpy was heavily influenced by Clampett shorts, and how these new Looney Tune cartoons, I see a heavy influence of Ren and Stimpy in these. So it's just you know Absolutely. the circle of life and all that stuff. <laughs> the circle of inspiration. The circle of inspiration. Spinning. Great artists steal. And, <laughs> <laughs> they do. And whenever I first reviewed. Um, a Curse of the Monkey Bird, which was the first Looney Tunes cartoons that was publicly shown in the theater, uh, I, I mentioned that it was Ren and Stimpy uh, influenced. And I I feel like with shorts like this, and obviously music shorts have their own tier, uh, you know, uh, 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 they stand alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as far as like, this is something that we should all appreciate. But I have never seen a Sylvester and Tweety short that was just music. Mm. And for them to do that and take that concept, take that, uh, that medium and be like, okay, so this tier has never been influenced by these characters. What if we inject these characters into it? And I feel like that's what gives it this uniqueness that we're appreciating that we're, we're just, in awe of wow these characters do translate even if there isn't dialogue and i know bugs and elmer also have one and it started at the beginning of this series called dynamite dance oh yes and it is bugs and elmer um and elmer is chasing bugs but bugs is just feeding him dynamite at every turn <laughs> and it's blowing up in his face but he's relentless and still like coming after him and that is set to a piece of music called the dance of the hours also done by tonic dna like i i just i adore these two shorts in this vacuum of we're going to suck the voice away there's there's not going to be any ac actual dialogue but we're going to retain the character and it it goes into duck amuck territory where you know chuck jones was like if i turn Daffy into another shape is it still Daffy if I take away Daffy's voice is it still Daffy and the resounding answer to that experiment was yes and the and the resounding answer to this is Sylvester and Tweety are still present these characters even though they're not changing shape yeah exactly <laughs> these characters have are just so well defined not only in their looks 
but in their personalities, and they have the advantage of just being around for so many years. I mean, Tweety's 81, and Sylvester's going to be 80, you know, and he's 78 right now, and we've had, and just the cultural impact that these characters have had for so long, and just the fact that these guys in at Tonic DNA and all and the rest of the crew there that they just said we trust these characters and we trust our animators and our writers and our layout artists and storyboard artists and all that to take this piece of music and make it work in such an incredibly you know and and like you were saying before we've never seen a musical Sylvester and Trudy cartoon I think of musical cartoons I think of you know I think of Bugs all the time I think of Elmer. I think of a lot of the one shot cartoons in particular, like I love a lot of the mid to late thirties, Mary melodies, because it's just how musical based they are, you know, music cartoons. Do you really think of Taz? Do you think of Foghorn? Do you think of no, because it's never been done before. And, you know, it also goes into the whole argument that I've seen with some, uh, I'm going to use my catchphrase from Anthony's uh, channel, but the nerds on the internet that like to argue (laughs) about, you know, they, they, they they talk about you know the the current uh, Looney Tunes cartoons the pros and cons or whatever and it it it's, it's funny how <clears throat> you have to find that nice delicate balance of not being so beholden to the original formulas or original pairings but also being willing to experiment because for example <clears throat> I, there was a video that came out on YouTube recently that was talking about like you know the the impact of Looney Tunes in the past thirty years from like the nineties on. And I'm the kind of person I don't want to see Foghorn with with Marvin Martian. I don't want to see Bugs with the. It's just like those pairings never occurred in the Golden Age, and these current Looney Tunes cartoons are more like they keep the traditional pairings: Bugs and Elmer, Bugs and Sam, Daffy and Porky, you know, Foghorn and Prissy, Bugs and Taz, Elmer and Daffy. But and. Elmer and Daffy exactly and like those are traditional pairings and that's something that you could say they keep to the formula the tradition but they experiment in other ways and in particular using uh, Sylvester and Tweety to do you know this musical short or the fact that they are using secondary obscure characters in these shorts to begin with and just giving them new life like uh, I know we're going to talk about in a bit but like bringing back uh, Ralph Phillips in particular. I'm like, I did not see that coming at all. I love that they're doing these old pairings. I love that they're reaching deep within the Looney Tunes well of characters and letting these, you know, shorts give new life to them because kids growing up these days don't know who Ralph Phillips is. And that is a joy to, Mm. I'm sure, parents to watch their kid enjoy the antics of a, a daydreaming little boy and you know um just, just seeing the way that they have incorporated these classic traditional jokes and storylines narratives um just, just the way they translated them into cartoons of this ilk is awesome and i'm here for it unlike you i'm okay with changing the pairings up because it gives us something even more fresher that is a terrible way of saying that but what i mean is um i like the idea to be creative with the characters and i want to know how marvin the martian would would react in a foghorn leghorn cartoon and if you know the dog is there if miss prissy is there how they all would react to marvin the martian trying to invade earth but it's foghorn leghorn that finds him first i i find that endlessly fascinating so I would be down for a unique pairing like that. Having said that, I guess oh, I do, guess ultimately it depends on who does it. Yes, you know? it does. Who's yeah. who's drawing it? Who's telling that story? That's why I also trust in the writers over there at uh, Looney Tunes Cartoons, headed by Pete Browngard, and you know the the entire gamut of talent that they have coming out of here. Uh, Skyscraper Scrap was written by uh, Michael Rucco as well, who did the storyboards, uh, David Gimmel, Johnny Ryan, and Jacob Fleischer, as I mentioned. And just that team, I feel they capture the right energy. They capture, you know, the the rambunctious, you know, 20-somethings who were working in Termite Terrace back in the 40s and coming up with these, like, crazy, zany cartoons with these characters and they were pulling pranks on each other and it was just 
you know, the glory days of we can do anything we want to do. What do we want to do? We want to tell this awesome, you know, art with this medium of animation. And they were vibrant and these are vibrant. And, you know, I, I just think that, again, not to be a broken record or uh, <laughs> a broken merry-go-round, but they are na- <laughs> knocking it out of the park every time. And uh, this is a perfect example of that. We're in the fifth batch, and I feel like this is one of the best selections of shorts we've ever had come come out of the series. Unfortunately, we only have one more batch after this, which mm. uh, has been confirmed by Pete Browngard, and that is coming in the summer in July. So we, we're we going to treasure what we have, and then we're going to look forward to the future. Um, but currently, we have more shorts to talk about. <laughs> so let's, let's move on. Um, Manny, what is your second favorite out of this batch? Oh, okay. So my second, I mean, obviously... You know, what do they call it? S tier, S tier, skyscraper scrap. Say that five times. <laughs> the, the, sky, the skyscraper tier. <laughs> sky, sky, oh, sorry, I got to say it in character. The skyscraper tier. You know, thanks, Elmer. Ooh, my second favorite. I, well, it's funny. I actually didn't see the short initially. I just heard about how cool the introduction is okay. and how cool the ending is. <laughs> so probably my number two, I wouldn't say, let's just say, you know, the second one in my list, so to speak. Yeah. Skyscraper scrap is definitely number one, but two and three, I can go back and forth with, but crumb and get it. And I am such a nerd for deep cuts. I am such a nerd for Easter eggs. Speaking of Easter eggs, I know uh, I just saw the Mario movie a few days ago, and I was eating up all the East or what would it be Yoshi eggs. But anyway, you know all the all the stuff that us, yes. you know, people who know Absolutely. know. And I was on, I think it was on Facebook a few days ago. You know, perusing the usual Looney Tune channels and whatnot, and somebody mentioned. Oh my God, they brought back the seven arts intro. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> and I clicked on it and I'm like, this is, this is the, the Patty Freeling seven arts intro. And, and it says Looney Tunes cartoon W and I'm like, and I heard the new rendition of the, the William Lava, uh, <laughs> a merry-go-round broke down rendition yeah, that, yeah. Who knew that I would actually come to appreciate after all these years? Because I used to see, I mean, many of them I haven't seen in 20, 25 years. But like I said before, I grew up watching most of my Looney Tunes on Nickelodeon. That's why I have such a love for the uh, Porky Pig shorts, as you can tell, he's my favorite character of the 30s and 40s. But also my heavy diet of the the Patty Freeling and Seven Art shorts. And just how weird and abstract that intro was. But just the fact that this crew brought it back and people who are not hardcore nerds like we are watch and saying, what the heck is this introduction? Me, I'm laughing hysterically. I'm like, I can't believe they brought it back. And just going right into the cartoon, I'm like, oh, my God, it's an homage to the 60s. (laughs) And it just looks so awkward. And the dialogue and, and oh, my God, such a huge shout out to Eric Bowser and Bob Bergen for not only for all this work they've done. And I, I love voiceover. Hopefully one day I could do it myself. But just for me, I and I don't know if you picked up on it, but their dialogue reading was so awkward and it worked because it's like, oh, my God, this is just a. This is just a big old slab of the Patty Freeling uh, <laughs> uh, Seven Arts dialogue, animation, music, and I'm like, oh, it's so weird. And it just, it they did something different because a lot of these, you know, a lot of the sh- cartoons of the past, you know, since the 80s or 90s, a lot of it is Jones influence, and a lot of it is now, especially with the Looney Tune shorts, are very heavy influence from Clampett and Avery. And I'm again, and I'm like, I love it. I love the fact that they're drawing upon just the work of all these amazing directors. But the fact that they, I mean, they probably were just laughing hysterically while storyboarding and and laying it out and and writing and all that. And I'm like, 
And I'm like, that's how you can tell these guys are legit fans. They love it. I always say, if you can make fun of the goofier, not as pleasant aspects of a pop culture franchise, you know that you love it. You know, like, uh, like I, I forget, you know, I, I've seen some examples in like wrestling or in other cartoons I watched where it's like they'll intentionally dunk on the goofier aspects of it. And you but at the same time, you feel the sense of love behind it. Yeah. So you nailed it. I, I wanted to give you a, a brief background on my take on this as well. Um, but I had this exact same reaction. So growing up with the classic reruns on ABC or on Nickelodeon, I would detest seeing that <laughs> Seven Arts logo or the DePatty Freeling intro. And I would be like, no, why can't we have the good ones? And oh, I didn't say I loved them, but, you no, know, no. there was something to watch. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and I would still watch them. But yeah. when that came up for me, um, and again, like as soon as this – uh, Looney Tunes cartoons dropped at midnight. I mid, like twelve oh one. I was clicking on these shorts and being like, "What do we got? What do we got?" And when this hit, I was balled over, laughing on my bed, going, "I cannot believe they did this!" <laughs> and when Daffy and Porky show up and they have those wild sixties designs. Okay, so brief history. Uh, DePatty is referencing David DePatty and Frizz Freeling. Uh, this is an era from 1963 to 1981, most known for Pink Panther cartoons. And they were an independent uh, animation studio that worked with Warner Brothers. And so you had the Warner, the uh, Warner Bros. Seven Arts cartoons logo. And that was strictly for like, movies of the 70s that Warner Brothers was producing and, and distributing. And so all of this coming together and them doing this weird throwback was super surprising, shocking. And I'm so glad I'm with somebody who understands that deep knowledge as well, because I knew I had to get somebody on the show to talk about this with me because I was laughing hysterically, but also Jim Soper went and redesigned Daffy and Porky just for this. And like they're fighting over feeding birds and it's just the most abstract looking and feeling cartoon and absolutely the voice acting. It must have been so awkward, like because they don't have the cartoon in front of them like we do when we're, we're watching the voices and putting it together. And I'm sure they were going from like cartoon to cartoon, like Daffy's wacky, Daffy's doing this. And then all of a sudden Daffy is feeding birds. Indeed, good sir. I just love feeding the pinch and birdies. Same here. <laughs> and can you reread that line? But can you be ten times more awkward and just like probably Eric and 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 Bob are just like what? They're like you're clearly professionals and you're great at it. Be more, you know, uh, as Daffy said in Yankee Doodle Daffy. Uh, you know, some might even say he's mediocre. And exactly, it's like the most <laughs> mediocre line readings in the world. But they're so funny when it comes together. And they're probably just looking at the, you know, the <laughs> at the crew recording and be like, what are we doing here? <laughs> and there are still zany antics like Daffy exactly, is frozen yeah. and he breaks apart into pieces. And that's very violent. It's still in tone with the, the shorts that we've seen. But because the design work and the also shout out to Aaron Spurgeon who did an incredible job with his team of layout artists and background artists, the colors match what was, what we were seeing in the sixties and seventies. Um, obviously we weren't alive, but those reruns that we were watching, like it is just so fascinating to dissect this short and it was directed by Pete Brongard. So like, you know, the big man himself came down and was like, no, I'm going to do this one. And, uh, <laughs> And it, it, Aaron Springer wrote it with him and it, it, oh my gosh, like I cannot praise this short enough for being bizarre, for being abstract, for being unexpected in the best way. Um, you know, Tiny Toons has 
expect the unexpected. Well, I didn't know I was supposed to expect the unexpected from Looney Tunes <laughs> cartoons, but here we are. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm I like, would... what are they going to do in the last batch? Because if this is what they're doing, you know, before it ends, what is the ending going to be? Are we going to see Bugs and Daffy in a short in a Chuck Jones era style, like, you know, rabbit fire? Are we going to get a sequel to that in some weird way or homage? I don't know, but I'm very excited because this short shows us, oh no, we appreciate the classics. We even appreciate the weird stuff and we're going to <laughs> give it back to you tenfold and allow you to let it wash over you and you will appreciate it too. Congratulations. My gratitude. The level of confidence, the level of artistry that went into this. Yeah, I mean, the whole thing is just like so weird, so bizarre. Highly recommend watching it. I cannot do it justice by telling you about it. It is an artist medium, and I highly recommend you let that uh, wash over you in the same way it washed over us. You said that, you know, us seeing the short as people who are, you know, we know our stuff when it comes to these cartoons, but I want to get the opportunity. I don't know who, but maybe one day I'm like, let's watch this cartoon. And I'm just curious to know what you're thinking. And I just want to just like, once it's done, after you hear the the final strain of the seven arts music and and the, the oh the and, they, and and someone pointed this out online, the fact that it looked like the screen was shaking like a film, and it yeah. like the intro looked faded, and I'm like, oh my god, it's just the little little details, and I'm and I just again, I'm just dying laughing watching it and just having them uh, stare at me and kind of be like a, one of my favorite scenes of The Simpsons where. Krusty the Clown after watching the uh, the Soviet era animation, he's like, "The hell is that?" <laughs> <laughs> and just me Absolutely. like, "Ha ha, do you get it?" <laughs> Never in a million years did I think we would ever appreciate that opening. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, it's you know, it, inspiration comes from all over, and mm -hmm. I'm really glad that they went to that well and found something new for us to enjoy about Looney Tunes because yes, that was an era that people looked down upon as Looney Tunes fans. We were like, that was a dark era. You know, that was a dark period. Let's not ever talk about it. Let's never revisit <laughs> it. And they were like, no, we're, we're going to revisit it and you're going to like it. So commendable. <laughs> well, we got the sixties now. Uh, I mean, let's see if they do, um, you know, the complete opposite. I mean, if they did something in the vein of the harmonizing years, I'm just oh, putting wow. it out there in the universe. But <laughs> let's just say, I mean, I don't know if Bosco will come back, but, you know, maybe Buddy or Beans or or some yeah. other flavors of the harmonizing in the early, you know, Leon Schlesinger tenure. I mean, if they do that, too, I'm just going to be like, I mean, I don't know. I'm just I'll just be very happy. I can't think of anything. You know, I'll just be very happy. I'll, I'll grin like uh, Tweety again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I I'm grinning ear to ear on this like let's let's keep talking about it because I, I just love it mm -hmm. so one of the ones that i had very high and obviously i started the show with this ralph phillips uh, let's talk about live in the daydream looks like it's my lucky day I've been in the market for a bearskin rug. This is a a wonderful little short that um, was directed by Ryan Kramer, who also worked on the story alongside Andy Gonzalez, uh, Johnny Ryan, Jacob Fleischer. And it reintroduces a character that, again, we haven't seen for many, many years. It was originally voiced by Dick Bills. From A to Z, that was his first uh, introduction to Looney Tunes by Chuck Jones. And then Boyhood Days, D-A-Z-E. Uh, then we had an evolution of that uh, in the 60s with 90 Day Wondering and Drafty Isn't It. Uh, these are uh, Dawes Butler voiced uh, versions of Ralph Phillips here. 
And, you know, as we got further away from Chuck Jones and like what it originally was, it just became this amalgam of like, you know, random weird scenarios. But I got to say the artistry that Chuck had in mind was this kid is going to be in school and daydreaming of being free from school. He's going to be dreaming that he's a bird dreaming that he's underwater fighting sharks while looking at the aquarium in the classroom. And it's very imaginative. And it's something that we don't see a lot in animation is the implementation of imagination in the (laughs) animation world, I think is something that is lacking. And I, honestly miss it because the last time I really had a reaction to something like that was Dexter's lab with the creature voiced by Paul Williams. And it was like that imaginary creature. I guess we also had some South park imagination land stuff. Um, (laughs) And uh, you know what, what this did was it took that concept and it was like in a modern cartoon, you would have references to what is happening in pop culture. And I think at the time, in the forties and the fifties, when Ralph Phillips was originally introduced, um, you wouldn't see Ralph Phillips being in a dramatic movie, but you would see him in a Western or you would see him in a sci-fi kind of scenario. And they put him there. This puts him in actual movies. So Ralph Phillips reenacting the opening to Batman, the animated series. I thought I told you ninjas to stay out of Gotham. Whoa. This is the last time. Is incredible to me. This was something that was shown at San Diego Comic Con uh, almost a year ago, and I was overjoyed by that. I was like, oh my gosh, they really went there. They they're t- they're doing like Batman and Looney Tunes together. What? Oh man, uh, I'm here for this. <laughs> and doing it with Ralph Phillips, I think, is a perfect conduit for that type of uh, synergy within the company. And then they had Mad Max, like a Mad Max Fury Road scenario with Ralph Phillips. They had Ralph Phillips wrestling a bear with, while being like this grizzled hunter. Um, like it, it was just so wonderful to see the artistry that went into the the mechanism of this classic daydream scenario but pushed to you know that synergetic degree and incorporating those other warner brother ip into it i mean it it is in itself a celebration of (laughs) wb100 which i i find fascinating as well um manny you saw living the daydream what did you think of this short and what was your favorite daydream scenario Sadly, I did not see it at San Diego Comic Con. I've never been to San Diego Comic Con. Hopefully, one year. But I've been to New York Comic Con multiple okay. times. You know, I like I said I live in. Uh, I was born and raised in New Jersey. Still live here. But uh, maybe one, maybe this year I'll go to. I have a a very close friend of mine that lives in San Diego. But he's he's not a Looney Tune nerd like us. But <laughs> he does love the Matrix. WB one hundred. There you go. There you well, go. look at that. Maybe you'll see. I know Space Jam two had a, a Matrix scene, which. I never saw until last year, so don't yell at me for that. But uh, yeah, this one was really cool. And I like how you said how, well, one thing that appealed to me a lot about the um, about the Ralph shorts, you know, in particular at Boyhood Days and from A to Z, which I saw growing up is, yeah, you could clear it like now as an adult and realizing it, you know, these were made in the 50s. Like, yeah, there's there's aspects of pop culture that were relevant to that time. The big sci fi craze and the Westerns. And uh, and everything like that. But yet the experience, because we both know of being a little boy, being bored out of their mind and daydreaming and it it, it still holds its appeal. And I really, yeah. really love the fact that they brought that, that back. And I mean, I know from many experiences of mine, I love her to death, my mother, but my God. I hate it going shopping with her as a kid. <laughs> and I was going to say the same and, thing. And I, yeah, and like. You know, I always tell kids now, you know, when I have my old man yells at cloud moment, but I'm like, when we were kids, we didn't have smartphones and (laughs) we didn't have iPads. Like, I remember vividly there was a a shopping store, I think called Pay Less or whatever. Um, Not the shoe place, but or Pay Half. There you go. Pay pay Less is the shoe place. But I remember going there. I was probably about, 
I don't know, eight, nine years old. So this is in the you know late nineties around that period. I didn't have a cell phone, you know, no tablets, internet. I didn't even know the internet existed yet. And I didn't have like a game boy or whatever. And I remember my mom spending four or five hours staring at the same shirt and going to the clothes rack, like the circular clothes rack yeah, and hiding inside there and just letting my imagination run wild. And I guess in this particular cartoon, because of the fact that it was in a, uh, you know, in a clothing store, it really spoke to me because of my experiences of like reenacting all the goofy stuff in my brain of thinking I'm, and again, a reflection of my pop culture taste, you know, thinking I'm a Ghostbuster, thinking I'm a Ninja Turtle, thinking <laughs> I'm, a, you know, a, I don't know, in a Looney Tune or whatever it may be. And uh I would say my favorite because I've actually never I know what goes on in the film, but I've I've never seen uh, Fury Road, but I did get the reference of like, Oh, that's really neat that they did that. And I didn't see and I, I get yelled at a lot from other people our age, but I did not watch a lot of Batman, the animated series growing up. But the intro is so iconic, the iconography, the art yeah. style, like I know it, obviously, you know, and I was like, wow, that's really cool that they did that. And and also, too, just with the, the design itself, and it kind of reminds me, I don't know if it's considered part of the same season, but of Hex Appeal with Witch Hazel sure. in it. And I like the fact like that in this short, as well as that one, that they really went heavy with the UPA influence that was in uh, Jones's shorts. I mean, all the directors, you know, McKimson and Freeling as well. But Jones in particular and the work that he did with Maurice Noble about implementing more of the UPA influence in the backgrounds, in the layout, in the in the, in the character designs themselves, and I was like, you know what, that's really neat, you know. And and it's been a while since I've seen Boyhood Days and from A to Z, but I'm like, I do remember seeing more of those. And I mean, it was part of a stylistic choice, but it was also a choice they made for budgetary reasons. But I mean, this one was really really neat, and it just makes me think. I'm like. Yeah, you know, like, and I almost forgot about the other two uh, Ralph Phillips shorts when, you know, the military ones, but I'm like, you know, they could really run wild if they were to make more of these cartoons in the future of, you know, Ralph Phillips just daydreaming and you, I was trying to think of the word. I'm like, what's that word? And you said it's synergy. And I'm like, synergy, Warner Brothers. No, I didn't (laughs) see that one coming, but (laughs) But it's like synergy that, like, in my opinion, this one, it worked incredibly well because, I mean, everybody knows Batman, especially just, you know, the, the Tim Burton films and, 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 and the Batman animated series and just how influential those two forms of Batman still are to this day. But just also how, yeah. I mean, I've seen other parodies of, you know, of Mad Max and Mad Max Fury Road in particular, but just here it was just it was again done so well and i also like the fact that they they were a little brave in terms of like content because you know sometimes and and you know i hear the horror stories of the 70s and 80s about how they were censoring a lot of the cartoon violence like like it was refreshing to watch looney tunes on nickelodeon because the violence wasn't as cut back as it was on like abc i mean the other dated aspects of the shorts i understand but like that scene that you mentioned where ralph was fighting the bear i was like i like it like he's like you know actually getting in the bear's face and being pretty aggressive and it reminds me of um i forgot which ralph one where like he was i think uh, the cowboy and he got shot with the arrows oh yeah yeah. or or the or the the scene it it reminded me of the scene from one of the shorts where he was fighting the shark with a knife in his mouth i was like right yeah like you know, add a little more meat on my bones, you know, a little more, a little more gritty, so to speak. <laughs> I thought you were going to say it reminded you of the Revenant, Leo, Leonardo DiCaprio's Revenant. You know what? That's, <laughs> it was what I couldn't remember the name of the film, but I, in the back of my mind, I'm like, is that a WB film? But maybe, it it okay, it is not, but hey, yeah. it, I mean, Warner Brothers borrow yeah. from everything, so it makes sense. But yeah, that's the film. I was like, I was going to mention it, but I was like, I was like, is it a Warner Brothers film? And I don't even know what it's called. You know, the bear film with Leo DiCaprio. That one. <laughs> <laughs> so this is actually the second time Looney Tunes in general has referenced uh, Mad Max Fury Road. The first coming from Space Jam A New Legacy where Wile E. Coyote mm. and Roadrunner are yes, put into that, that world as they are kind of scattered throughout the server verse. So it's really fun to see, again, that synergy come back. 
but also Mad Max is a wonderful movie and just it's I love seeing it celebrated in animation and getting more people interested in seeing it um, or live action animation with uh, Space Jam because you had uh, LeBron there as well. But one of my favorite deep cuts here actually comes from a Bugs Bunny short, which I don't know if you caught, but the store owner, the manager that comes over to request Ralph Phillips and his mom to leave the shopping store is the same design of character from uh, Hair Conditioned, the Stacy's store manager, uh, which is a parody of Macy's back in the day. And uh, that was one of Bugs's cross-dressing moments was whenever he tricked that store manager into uh, fitting Bugs with some shoes. Uh, <laughs> good evening, miss. I'd like to see something nice in a pair of bedroom slippers. Confidentially, so would I. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like, I, I love these deep cuts. I love that you'll... It, again, expect the unexpected. Um, <laughs> and you may see a character that you didn't think you'd ever see again popping up in Looney Tunes. And I love that. But again, this was so fun to watch, so imaginative. And just to mention, uh, Carrie Walgreen was the voice of Ralph Phillips in that short. So, you know, shout out to her work because it's not easy to be a boy uh, <laughs> in animation. Uh, as as Nancy Cartwright has shown us throughout the years, um, it, it takes a lot of nuance. And I feel like Carrie Walgreen really brought that to Ralph Phillips this time. And it was the first time a female has voiced the character. So uh, kudos to her. I thought she did a phenomenal job. And it sounded like Ralph Phillips to me. Um, did, it, did you have any issues or hangups with the voice? No, not at all. I mean, it's cool that, you know, we had a, a young uh, male actor do it back in the 50s, and then you had Dodds Butler do it for uh, um, adult Ralph. But, uh, I mean, yeah, it's been a trend for the yeah. past, you know, I guess probably since, you know, the dawn of television animation to have a, a woman do a little boy's voice. And, yeah, she knocked it out of the park. Like I said, Nancy Cartwright would be proud. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, too bad we can't do it. I mean, if you asked me to, you know, record it back in 1995, I could have helped you out, but, you know, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. For those interested on my Instagram, shout out to my Instagram real quick, um, where I post news and little clips and reels that I put together from classic shorts or the new ones, uh, just to celebrate all Looney Tunes. Sometimes I talk about those topics, sometimes we don't. But I try to. And uh, one of the videos I did was uh, Elvis, when Elvis was uh, on Blu-ray or DVD or whatever, um, I put together this song, Edge of Reality, uh, which is an Elvis song to Ralph Phillips. And I intercut it with those <laughs> scenes of him fighting the shark and being a bird and daydreaming in school and it I, I watched it yesterday and I was like, you know, this is actually like really solid. <laughs> I like I like this. Um, so I might do more of those. So, yeah, just uh, keep an eye out on the Instagram for zany antics of my own when it comes to cutting up these uh, classic shorts and representing them to a new generation. The public demands it. The TikTok generation <laughs> wants it. <laughs> So the exact opposite of what the TikTok generation wants are more samurai. <laughs> exactly. That's what that's that's what I mean. Us, we were. I mean, I was. Uh, I don't. I don't have any of it. Around, it's in the other side of the room. But I mean, it's not like you know. I was heavily influenced by Ninja growing up. You know, New York sure. City pizza. You know, no, no connection whatsoever. But samurai. No, that's the new hip thing. I mean, there's samurai pizza cats. I mean, does anybody remember watching that besides me? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great I theme song. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a Yosemite Samurai short in here called aptly Yosemite Samurai. And I absolutely adored this short. It is so creative. And we got to talk Bugs Bunny because Bugs Bunny has been put through the ringer in this series. And I feel like this is the first short that he really comes to own his uh, adversary uh, without his adversary getting any kind of upper hand on him. Um, you have Yosemite Sam in the samurai era, and he has donned this, you know, uh, ancient Japanese like wardrobe and armor. And he is trying to, um, just get rid of bugs 
And Bugs is like, no, I can, I can be here too. Um, this was on your list, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So Manny, take it away. What is this short about and why did you like it so much? Well, <clears throat> I saw the title of it. I was like, oh, clever pun. You know, I'm always a sucker for puns and alliteration. Uh, I mean, heck, look at my screen name, the Toonie Tenor. There's alliteration right there. But uh, as I was watching the beginning of the short, <laughs> I, I saw the <laughs> beginning. I was looking at the credits and then I paused it. And I'm like, and I, I really hope I pronounce his name right. But uh, Kione Young. And I'm like, that's Zhang Zhang. And then, you know, for <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge fan of Avatar The Last Airbender. And I recognize his name from the show. He played, you know, the character Zhang Zhang. I'm not going to spoil who he is, but, you know, he's a secondary character in the show. I was like, oh, my God, that's so cool. And then the cartoon starts. It's set in feudal Japan and, and all that, you know, probably like the 1600s or whatever. And then I hear Keone Young narrating the beginning. I was like, oh, my God, it's so cool. So it's like for me having because um, for those that will eventually see, I guess, if you want to follow my socials, my my little uh, avatar uh, or my uh, profile pic is an amalgamation of the because there's different things in pop culture I love. I call myself a multifaceted media geek. But the th things I love the most in particular, obviously, Looney Tunes, Looney Tunes, The Simpsons, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Ghostbusters, and the Avatar universe, Avatar, Legend of Korra, whatnot. And I love the fact that <clears throat> I made that connection because of voice acting, of hearing that specific voice from a show that I love so dearly connected into this modern Looney Tunes universe. And going yeah. in the same vein... You know, the amazingly talented uh, Eric Bauza, you know, obviously doing an incredible job as Bugs, Daffy, Tweety, and whatnot. But in the scene where he takes Sam's armor and he starts talking in, you know, like a more, you know, dignified, um, authoritarian, you know, Asian voice. And for me, I made the other pop culture connection. I was like, that's the voice he uses for Tiger Claw in the 2012 Ninja Turtles cartoon. And I mean... You know, nice. I love voice actors. It's as a singer, you know, it's something I, I'd like to do myself. But just like having making those connections of hearing the voices like, oh, Avatar, oh, 2012 TMNT. And it's just and just the versatility of, of just the voice actors themselves, how, you know, he goes from bugs to this authoritarian, you know, samurai warrior voice back to bugs and whatnot. And and I like that you said that this is the first uh, not the first short, but this is a short where it's like. Bugs is the winner. Bugs is Bugs. Because, yeah. I mean, depending on who you ask, <clears throat> I mean, some of my favorite Bugs shorts are the Bugs Loser shorts. You mm -hmm. know, Tortoise Beats Hair, uh, Falling Hair, uh, Tortoise... I mean, the whole, you know, uh, Bugs Cecil Turtle trilogy, Falling Hair. Um, uh, Anytime Rhapsody. a creature is smaller than Bugs, uh, Bugs usually gets the, uh, the losing end of that stick. <laughs> well, then I was going to say, then why is Sam always beating it? Oh, I mean, because Sam's pretty small. I mean, that's a short man myself. <laughs> short King Spring, ladies and gentlemen. But uh, but yeah, but it was refreshing to see Bugs really being in his element because like when I was uh, watching, oh, I forgot the name of it, but uh, the the I think Mummy Bunny or the one, you know, oh, where yeah. he's in ancient Mummy Egypt. Dummy. Mu um, yeah, uh, Mummy Dummy. And um, and the parts of it where it's like, I'm not really used to seeing bugs being, you know, smacked around like that. Or yeah. the other one, too, the the, El the Bugs Elmer short uh, where uh, Elmer was building the condo. Like, it's cool okay. seeing that Elmer yeah. has his moments of throwing his jabs in, but I'm not used to it. Mm -hmm. And but it was it was I think that's why this was one of my favorite shorts and probably my favorite bug short of this batch, hands down, because yeah. this is the bugs that I know and love. And 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 overall, I would say in all the Looney Tunes cartoons, not not the older shorts, I'm talking about this current batch. But I think the dynamic of Bugs and Elmer, I uh, sorry, Bugs and Sam, I enjoy more than Bugs and Elmer in this. And it's not a knock on the animators or the or the the voice actors or whatever. It's just that I think the dynamic works better in this batch with Bugs and Sam than with Bugs and Elmer. And um, and Fred Tattashore also, just knocks it out of the park with his oh, Yosemite. I Sam. love like, his Sam voice. It, yeah. It's so soothing to hear uh, him <laughs> struggle to <laughs> to get it's there. Like, that deep that deep gravitas. Uh, he, he but mean, he nails it. 
Yeah, I mean, I get, you know, hearing the stories of Mel Blanc having to do Yosemite Sam and then, you know, Taz and then having, you know, Fred Tatashore doing that now. And another Ninja Turtles connection. He was rock steady in the 2012 series. So I'm showing my <laughs> I'm showing my nerd. <laughs> uh, a few other things I want to mention about this one is there was uh, I really, really enjoyed the ending. It was cool seeing, you know, yes. the the bugs um, as a as uh, you know when he was dressed up as in the, in the kimono and then he came out as the the ancient demon or whatever it was and i loved funny. how they did his hair or how they yes. styled the hair in the bun i thought yeah. that was really clever it reminded me of um uh i, I don't know if uh, the uh, usagi yojimbo comics or Miyamoto yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah reminded me of that a little bit yeah. i mean he is he is literally a you know a rabbit samurai, a rabbit samurai. <laughs> and um and uh the 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 joke where um I forget if it's called Harikari or Seppuku. I know that, you know, from Ninja Turtles, obviously. But, you know, the fact that he had to, you know, did he dishonored himself. And knowing the joke, it's like, oh, this was something that Samurai did in real life. And like, yeah, they have to kill themselves. But I like those moments in, in, in the Warner Brothers shorts. Like, they had some dark material in them. But it was done in a funny, tasteful way. And here... I felt that same way. It was like, it's a dark joke if you know where it's going, but it was really, really, really done well. And speaking of elements, like, I guess the more it's, it, it's something that just popped in my head. I don't know if, the, if you were thinking the same thing, but seeing this short and then in my head, I was replaying a particular bug short from the forties with bugs in Japan. And I couldn't help but think about, that one while i was watching this one and a part of me was like thank goodness they made this one because it kind of like cleanses the palate of i mean for the for the casual looney tune fan they don't know but you know for the hardcore fans i was like thank goodness they updated the you know bugs traveling to japan <laughs> yes and I, honestly i was I, I guess halfway through i made that connection because i did a episode on um on asian hate as it was really prominent um back at the beginning of 2022 and i wanted to address that as well as talk about the problematic era of looney tunes in japan and and how it appropriated that culture and it did cross my mind but again like you're saying i'm glad this one exists so we have and it was one of the things that i said as well we need more examples of how this could be done in a in a better way than just the examples we have whenever you say japanese looney tunes you're like oh no um but whenever yeah. you know this comes out it's like okay now we can take this and add it to that you know larger conversation of looney tunes in japan and this obviously doesn't clean any slates or anything like that, but it is an example of, Oh, bugs can be funny in Japan if they did it in this respectful way. And, mm -hmm. you know, with these darker, dark humored elements, it doesn't have to be racist. It doesn't have to be, you know, um, black and white in that, in that sense, it can be more nuanced. It can be something that we can all celebrate and laugh at, but not feel bad uh, for any or having having a race at the at the behest of the joke. Yeah, the um, <clears throat> and it's interesting too that again, just everything I you know they always say it, especially about music, but just with other forms of art, that art does not exist in a vacuum. It is a reflection right. of its time period. And you know, like for the and 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 I get a little annoyed sometimes when I see articles online or people posting about like, oh, look at the band Looney Tunes and whatever, and it's like. Obviously, they exist, and obviously, they're they're problematic. And they're for me, I look at them more as discussion pieces. I'm not one of these guys on on various forms screaming to the high heavens. All of them should be released, and everybody's got to, you know, suck it up. It's like no, no, nuance. No. The yes. word is nuance. <laughs> but you know, thinking of uh, when I honestly don't even want to say the name of the cartoon because it's technically a slur. But the yeah. the bug short from the '40s. You know, it's a reflection of history, you know, during World War II, the Axis and the Allied Powers and Pearl Harbor. And I'm a history buff. I, you know, I don't want to turn this into Manny's animation. Uh, sorry, and Manny's history talk. But <laughs> but now looking at it from the different perspective of how 
in the past 20 years or so how heavily influenced animation is by anime, anime, whichever way. I mean, technically it's anime, but the the heavy influence of anime with, you know, with Pokemon and Sailor Moon and Dragon Ball Z and whatnot and related to Looney Tunes, how when I first really started getting into the hobby of researching the history of the shorts, because real quick, I was in middle school and I was at my computer. I was, you know, this is like late 2000, early 2001 around that time. And Bosco popped in my head. I was like, I was like, Ooh, chocolate syrup. Wait, no, that's the name of a character. I used to see as a little kid. Uh, man, I can go over some of that chocolate syrup now. And uh, he, I vaguely remembered seeing Bosco when I was very young. Cause Bosco stopped airing on Nickelodeon, I think 92, 93. So that was about four or five years old. Yeah. And I looked it up. I was like, Bosco, Bosco. I didn't know who he was. I'm like, he was just a cartoon character that looked like Mickey Mouse and whatever. And I typed it in and it brought me to the old Looney Tunes, Mary Melody's early years site. And I was like, wait, Bosco's a Looney Tunes character? The Looney Tunes are from the 30s? What? And the that's when i started going down pun intended the rabbit hole <laughs> and and that's why i'm talking to you right now you know just uh 20 something years of doing that research and it's it's funny how around that time 2000 you know yeah around 2000 yeah. looney tunes got pulled from nickelodeon Charging they were pulled in 99 yeah. uh the bugs bunny show finally ended after 40 years in 2000 off of you know uh, abc and my diet of Warner Brothers shorts, as well as other ones like, you know, the Max Fleischer Popeyes and and uh, the MGM, Tom and Jerry and Avery shorts, they were all on Cartoon Network. And I loved that era of Cartoon Network, how not only I was enjoying, you know, recording these cartoons and writing in the books that I bought, you know, Jerry Beck's books and Will Freewald and all the other ones and Michael Barrier, like I still have those books to this day, but enjoying that, but on the other side, enjoying the, the explosion of and uh you know of anime of you know i started watching dragon ball z around that time i was you know i love whenever a little kid has a pokemon card and they're like oh look at the pokemon card i'm like i know what that is that's a pikachu that's a charizard that's a totodile and they're staring at me like you're a grown-up how you know about it? i'm like do you know when pokemon came out in the united states they're like no i'm like 1998 you know who was a fifth grader back then and i just walk away and they go what I was like, I was a first generation of Pokemon fans, you know, and again, it's cool now that these shorts reflect more of the modern sensibilities of not only just Japanese culture, but just the influence of, you know, anime in animation in general. I mean, think of all the shows now or even movies like I didn't see the film, but I heard that, uh, you know, Creed, uh, Creed 3. Sure. Um, you know, with Michael B. Jordan, who graduated high school not far from me in Newark, New Jersey, arts high school. He actually went to high school with a friend of mine. Fights. And yeah, yeah, it's like I hear like you're like it's live action Dragon Ball Z fights going on. And it's like it's <laughs> inescapable. And you and you see that too in, in Yosemite Samurai. And and I think that's what makes it so enjoyable. And again, kind of not to cleanse the sins of the earlier short and of the older propaganda, but just like this is where we were. But we're here now, and fortunately, we're moving towards a more nuanced, respectful, you know, because, I mean, with with music in particular, which is arts in general, it's like we're the gateway to different cultures, to thoughts, to philosophies. And it's just that's why I love, you know, animation. I love music so much because I've learned so much about different cultures and whatnot through there. And food, too. Food's a great way to learn about culture. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, bringing it back down to Yosemite Samurai, I uh, just wanted to give a shout out to its director, Kenny Pittenger, and Andrew Dickman, who did the storyboards for it. Um, again, it is it, it is a really good cartoon. And, you know, as we were mentioning, it does bring it back to a bit more classical uh, pairing of Yosemite Sam and Bugs Bunny, which is again nice to see <laughs> in a in a series that is bug centric um they they really do have a lot of variation with how they use the character and to see it brought back to just this classic formula um was really nice and i i really enjoyed it as well so i just wanted to quickly run down cuz we are at the hour mark um okay. the uh uh, other honorables, uh, honorable mentions from this batch. Um, I really enjoyed 
a few of them that we're not going to be f- fully diving into, but uh, Feather of the Bride caught me by surprise. That's a Foghorn Leghorn short um, where we got to see Miss Prissy's extended family. <laughs> and those characters were all really fascinating to uh, to see, all designed by Jim Soper. And I thought they were really hilarious. Uh, There's this really great chess gag that I laughed at. <laughs> and, then I, and then I thought back on a couple of days later and I was still laughing at it. And then Fake It Till You Bake It is a Petunia short trying to celebrate Porky Pig's birthday uh, where she <laughs> she says that she has a homemade cake and it's store bought and then it gets ruined. <laughs> and so then she actually has to bake something, but she's never baked anything before. And I thought that was really funny as well. And yeah, I guess my last notable mention would be Bullseye Bunny, which is um, it has one of my favorite bugs lines from all of Looney Tunes cartoons, which is me and my thirst for revenge. <laughs> <laughs> when he's tied up on the wheel and he, he's gotten in trouble again and he's just, you know, dang, <laughs> ah, me and my thirst for revenge. <laughs> Do you have any uh, honorable mentions that we didn't get to talk about? Uh, you mentioned three of them that I had, you know, Feather the Bride, Bullseye, and um, Fake It Till You Bake It. I mean, like I said, Porky's my favorite. It, and I really like how they're using Petunia in these shorts. Uh, yeah. Jeff Bergman, it's Foghorn Leghorn. Hilarious. I mean, I, lo- I love Foghorn Leghorn. My, da- it's, my dad really also likes Foghorn Leghorn because, you know, they're both windbags. And uh, <laughs> and two others that um, I want to bring up. I think it's I don't have the name in front of me, but I think Funny Book Bunny. With, oh uh, yes, with uh, Elmer making his his revenge comic book, and and That's I love the, the beginning it, yeah. too, like the acknowledgement of he says I've been chasing this squirrel wabbit for eighty years, and you see a on on the on the board you see what's up Doc and the wacky wabbit and the harebrained hypnotist and a wild hair, and I'm just like ah. Oh, Give me all the Easter eggs. And and it so also good. gave me vibes of Porky's preview of how horribly drawn the characters are by Elmer, but they're beautifully animated and kudos to the yeah. staff. And the one that I was going to put in my top three, but I decided not to because I figured this would be the popular choice for Looney Tune fans. But I really enjoyed Kitty Crashers, you know, a yeah. remake of Kitty Cornered. Love yeah. seeing the... Um, <clears throat> the the revival of the the Clampet Cats, you know, Sylvester's crew. I mean, he didn't say in this cartoon, but I one of my favorite lines in any cartoon is one of the and I ironically I hate this food, but the small cat goes, "I like cheese." And <laughs> Sylvester smacks him. It's too bad they didn't do that gag here. Uh I love the fact cuz again, like I was saying with Bugs, Bugs gets slapped around in these shorts a bit, and the same thing with Porky. I'm glad Porky got his he got the win at the end. He got his come up and and um, and also like, you know, having the cats pay for their crimes and love again, a, a, another loving reference or clamp it having the hulking rat from uh, yes. from the, uh, the, uh, the great piggy bank robbery make a, a reappearance. <laughs> and I was like, wow, who, who would have thought that that, you know, come out, you rat, uh, you know, and I'm like, oh, he's back after 40, uh, 70 years. And With the um, cheese tattoo on his yeah. arm. <laughs> Again. Yeah, such a good reference. And and of course, at the very end, you know, you, you might blink and miss it. Sniffles, right? Sniffles, good old Sniffles is there. I mean, he didn't <laughs> he didn't talk, but he was there. He didn't sneeze. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, honestly, like Kitty Crashers was written on my list initially, but there were so many good ones that I really wanted to touch upon. And, you know, just seeing the the level of artistry across the board here is so inspiring. And I hope mm-hmm. if you're out there and you're watching this and you're an, an aspiring artist or an animator, that you will go to these cartoons and you will find inspiration on your own and, and you know, I- inject some new art into the world. And if you follow my Instagram at This Means Podcast, I do a Fan Art Friday where if you have hashtag fan art Friday, I will reshare it if I see it uh, in my stories uh, so other people can see it. And that has upwards of like 200 views uh, every week. So I highly recommend checking out uh, the Instagram for that art. But also if you're an artist, you know, just practice, you know, just put something out there and uh, maybe somebody someday will see it. And that will be really cool. 
maybe I'll draw one uh, for one of the Fan Art Fridays. But it's going to look like you know Elmer's drawings from Funny Book Bunny. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay. warning you now. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. If you draw a drawing from Funny Book Bunny, then it would be perfect. <laughs> I'll, I'll I'll stick to singing. <laughs> Well, Manny, this has been a delight. Thank you for, so much for coming on the show. This has been a, a exploration of Looney Tunes cartoons, the newest batch. And if you, again, if you haven't seen it, highly recommend it. It's on HBO Max, soon to be Max, uh, on your streaming services. So, um, Manny, where can people find you online and over at Anthony's Animation Talk? So, yes, uh, once again, I'm Emmanuel Cruz. I also go by Manny. I'm the Toonie Tenor. Um, you'll, uh, you'll see me popping up occasionally on, uh, like I said, Anthony's animation talk. I hopefully will be getting my own content out soon. Um, you can find me on my various socials. I'm on Instagram. I'm on YouTube, Facebook, uh, TikTok. I mean, some of two, two of my most popular TikTok videos are just Looney Tune clips, one from rabbit hood and the other one from uh, patient Porky. And they're all at the Toonie Tenor, T-H-E-T-O-O-N-E-Y-T-E-N-O-R. Because I have to tell people it's Toonie, long story short, Toonie for cartoons, tenor, because that's my voice type for singing. But I've added the E in the word Toonie because my first name starts with an E. And also, not to get confused with uh, Toonie the Tuna from uh, (laughs) uh, Toonie with me. There's a lot of T's, uh, a lot of alliteration. But yeah, at the Toonie Tenor, yeah. (laughs) And uh, yeah, that was a mouthful. (laughs) All good. All good. I think people will find you and I highly recommend it as well. You post uh, really great, inspiring and informative things across your Instagram as well. Um, You can follow the podcast over at Instagram and Facebook at This Means Pod. You can also follow us on Twitter at OFC This Means Pod and look out for the TikTok because I'm going to be posting once we get more information about Wiley Coyote versus Acme as in Coyote versus Acme, the new movie produced by James Gunn. I will be posting a lot more on TikTok about information around that. So follow the podcast because there is a lot more going on in the Looneyverse now. So I will be covering Tiny Toons, which we got a release date for, which will be this fall, and so much more. So keep it right here because that's not all, folks. Woo! <laughs> Ain't I an anchor?